Well, hi everyone. Welcome to the data management section where we're going to be talking with Mohammed, who is the CEO of Patients Know Best. Mohammed, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure, Kyle. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, to give the audience again a little bit more context of why we're having this interview, we've looked at well over 120 companies that we consider a part of the data management category as a whole. And one of the companies that really stood out to us was Patients Know Best. The reason why is because they have a lot of different unique features uh, that you can do with patient data, uh, patient data management. And um, the, the purpose of this interview today is to really dive deep in not only how they're collecting data, what they're doing with that data, what are the unique aspects of their platform, and more. So I'm super excited about this. Before we even jump into product questions, Mohammed, you have a visual for us, so that gives an audience a good baseline understanding of what you guys are doing, and then we'll go from there. So I'll give it, I'll give it back to you. Sure thing, I'll just show you. Um, th this is what we do. We basically think that uh, healthcare is safer and cheaper if you have one record for every person that receives data from everywhere and it follows the patient wherever they go. Um, if you have your data from your physician before you see, before you go to the emergency department, that encounter is safer. Um, if you can put your own data in between appointments, that physician can keep an eye on you and look after you. And if you have the data from your physician, uh, as soon as it comes, your test results, your x-rays and so on, uh, you can self-assess, you can, you can self-manage, uh, you can look after yourself more conveniently, but also more safely at home. Uh, so we go for a vision of uh, one record, it's complete, accurate and real time uh, with our architecture. Wonderful. No, I think um, I think this is a great uh, stepping stone about the importance of having a centralized location, or at least putting patients in control of their own data. Uh, with that, let's let's jump into one of the next questions that I had. I'm just curious: is there a backstory about why you started this company? I uh, sure. Uh, so let me. I'll give you one slide while I'm talking. That's perfect. Uh, but, uh, for the backstory. Um, so this is me. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a geek, as you'll discover during this call. Uh, I'm a, I trained as a physician and programmer, and I uh, went to the States and wrote six books about using computers in healthcare. Uh, what gets me really interested in is uh, using technology in the hands of the people doing the doing. Um, so when I started off on uh, Palm Pilot's personal digital assistance. When I was in the States, uh, I wrote a book for my customers, hospital CIOs, about how do you open up your record for patients? Uh, if you're the IT director of the hospital, how do you make sure your patients can see their test results, their care plans, and so on? And, and I became obsessed with that problem. Uh, this is 2007, 2008, because uh, I have a rare disease. So am I, when I see my physician, he panics, doesn't know what to do. Uh, and I tell him, you know, my ENT said this, my immunologist said that, they think you might want to do the following. And he does it. And I realized when I was writing the book that my physician didn't trust me because I'd gone to medical school. He trusted me because I'd gone to every appointment. That's what a patient does. You're the only one who is there in every encounter with the healthcare system. So you end up being the integrator. You end up being the historian. And I kept on seeing examples from hospitals in the USA where the more data the patient had, uh, the more happy the patient was, the more safe the healthcare delivery was, but also the cheaper everything was. So it was win, win, win. And I spent 2007, 2008, this is when Google Health and Microsoft Health Vault were launching, uh, begging US hospital CIO saying, you have to do this. Um, I, I'm, I found a whole bunch of reasons why they weren't doing it. And most of them I thought, well, this is a good business because if you can find something that's good to do, but hard to do, then uh, you can build a business on making it happen faster and better. Um, but there was one problem which uh, I couldn't get the US healthcare providers to get around, which is they would say to me, why would I share my customer's data, that's the patient record, with my competitor, that's the other hospital. They did not actually want to cooperate. And a lot of their initial portals were uh, attempts at locking in the patient to the healthcare system 
rather than opening up the data for healthcare provision. Uh, so I thought uh, if I, th this is not happening at anywhere near the scale and the speed that I want. Uh, so if I want this to happen, I really do as a patient myself. Um, I've literally written the book about it uh, and I need to just make it happen. Uh, and the problems that they described, most of them I can fix, but one of them around the incentives, I need to go to a country where I can prove that this works and then the payers will make the providers work in this way. Uh, but I need to start because it's so hard in the least painful payer environment. Uh, and that was the UK with the National Health Service. So I left the USA in 2008, came back to the UK uh, and started the company Patients Know Best in, in Cambridge, my hometown. Wow. Incredible. I guess you're the perfect man for the job. <laughs> I'm highly motivated to be. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's interesting that, especially for this category, or this industry, healthcare is probably, I think, one of the most unique because of this idea that uh, a lot of founders in this space typically have a personal story that uh, is really the driving factor about why they start uh, these companies. And um, uh, in, in these settings, the personal story is sometimes even life or death situations or very, very serious situations and very personal. Um, it's always interesting to see uh, the backstory behind it, but seven, six books, seven with the chef book. Uh, I, absolutely I, incredible. I, I was in Baltimore and um, a chef called me up and she said that she read my book for physicians and she wanted me to know that chefs were like surgeons, that they were both um, short of time and short of temper. And so we rewrote the book from Palm pilots for physicians to palm pilots for chefs. I, I learned a lot about cooking. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, really interesting. And I, I kind of want to jump into the platform itself and start with the basics of how do you start by um, gathering patient information into a centralized location? Uh, how is that possible? What are the methods and processes that you use to gather this information? So in the beginning, uh, we just offered a standard SaaS uh, solution, which is it's a website. Uh, any human beings can log in and put data and they could just start cooperating. So the first people to work on it were uh, a physician in London in the UK's National Children's Hospital called Great Ormond Street Hospital. Uh, and she had uh, 35 children she was looking after uh, from across the UK uh, with a very rare condition, which meant they couldn't eat food through their mouth. They had to have it in a tube in their hearts. And she said to me when I first met her, she said, I'm really worried about these children. And genuinely, as you could see, she constantly worries about the safety and thinks of these children. And she said, these children, when they go to their hospital, their local hospital, they are the only child that hospital physician has seen with that condition. They do not know how to treat that child. Now, they know, the only person who knows how to treat that child is the mother who's come with the child. But they don't listen to the mother. They say, no, no, we have to call London. We have to get a fax for them on how to treat them. She said, can I give these families data so it's with the child so when they're in the emergency department the mother can say look great ormond street hospital said this is how my child should be treated and you can begin treatment immediately in the correct way so i i said to her look um you know we can do a lot of things i can do test results care plans what do you want she goes i just want to give them the letter that i used to post for them i said um okay i mean fine, you can do whatever you'd like. Uh, you can, here's how you upload. Um, but you know, I, I wish she was more ambitious, but let, let's get her going. And she calls me the next day. She said, um, yesterday I put five letters for five children in the system. And today a mother replied to my letter on Patients Know Best and said, there's an error in the letter. And she said, I've been a specialist for more than 15 years. It's the first time I get corrected. Now, I know my letters are full of errors because I can't know everything. No one tells me. It's too difficult for them to tell me. So, but I put five and I got one correction. 
So then she says to me, what else can I send you? Because the more I can give the families, the more they fix stuff and the more quick it is and the safer it is for the children. That's how we started. It's a website. Um, physician can upload things, patient can enter things, and they can message between each other. Um, 2015 was our first big break when uh, Northwest London, which is a region of 2.4 million people, said we're going to send all the data into, into the system. Uh, so 16 hospitals, 400 physicians' offices, uh, health and social care, everything's going in. That was our big scale contract. Um, but what got us to that point was uh, up to that point, we'd had all these small deployments, uh, 35 children here, 300 HIV patients there, 200 gastro patients here, and showing that in every specialty, in every locality, this thing can work. Uh, until when London came and said they want to do something, for 2.4 million, we had all the proof points, and then they switched on the service from their end, and the fire hose basically came on. So all the uh, we, we get millions of test results uh, every week um, for for uh, millions of patients across the UK, uh, and we operate in other countries with different data centres. Um, but that's how the data gets in, either from a computer system that sends everything it has into us. Um, or from humans who manually upload things. And then when it's in the system, anyone can use it with the patient's consent. So if it's, a patient can log in on their phone, the physician in their uh, hospital, and the programming interface makes the data available to any other system with the patient's consent. So you can get it back in the hospital, you can get it in a third party app and so on. Interesting. And uh, do you find that, um, uh, most of the data now that it's collected is working directly with providers. Uh, it, it comes and goes in phases, you know, so every time I think I've got it figured out, um, something new happened, which is really interesting. Mm. Um, I, so just to, to give you an example, so we switched on all the feeds from all the hospitals and it was tremendous for the patients that could see their test results real time. So I had a patient, um, an HIV patient, the, the day he heard the feed was, was working, uh, he said, I'm going to go and get myself a blood test. Uh, and he texted me happy because he got a blood test. And two hours later, he got the test results. And he got it before his physician did. Uh, and for an HIV patient, that's really valuable because 70% of them are stable. They're working age. They don't want to take half a day off work to get their test result. All they need is their test result. And now he can get it from work, control his life, and so on. Um, so then you think, okay, well, the big thing is the release of the data automatically from the physician's office. Next, we have um, people who are saying, I want to use this uh, to monitor patients with depression. Um, and they realize that we have data from Fitbit that monitors your sleep. So now the physician can see the last six months of your sleep cycle inside patients in their best. And you think, well, okay, how do you get that into the medical record inside the physician's office? Uh, the traditional hospital or physician's office system has nowhere to store six months of your date of your sleep data. They just have a checkbox. Did you sleep well? Yes or no. So this is all completely new data that nobody knows what to do with. And now we've just upgraded our APIs again. The next thing we're looking at is it's not just can you get the data from the hospital or the data from the device or the data from the patient. The fact that you're looking at data is data. So if you log in to look at your test result, how quickly do you look at it? That should be a good indicator of how good you are complying with your medications. And if you're not looking at your data at all, then that's a patient you wanna find a different way of engaging with because that's the one who's not gonna be sticking to their diet, sticking to their exercise, taking their medications. So that's a whole other data set that exists nowhere, which is data about looking at data. So it, it becomes really interesting to see what happens when you have a single record across everyone. What, what, what do you start doing with that environment? Interesting. I'm, I'm curious, and I know you already highlight a couple different examples, and I know it varies drastically up across the uh, patients, but um, what are the common triggers that you see for patients to come to the platform to want to see their data or to want to be able to interface with their data? So in general, um, patients do not need to be convinced. Uh, they need to be allowed. Um, the, the biggest barrier to bringing on the patients, engaging the patients, is that the physicians 
uh, feel uncomfortable and they project their discomfort onto patients. They think uh, this one's too old, this one's too ill, this one's too poor, they can't speak English, you know, all these reasons why this patient can't cope. It's not true. We, uh, the data we have is it matches the demographics of people who visit the ED, it's the same gender distribution, same age distribution. Um, <clears throat> it's also the same uh, socioeconomic distribution. Uh, so the real barrier is, do you tell the patient this exists and do you trust them to see everything? Uh, and so what we did in a couple of years ago is automate the offer to any patient to make use of. Uh, so when you come to kiosk, it lets you register. Uh, you get a letter at home that lets you register. You get a text message that lets you register. And when you do, um, the patient gets it, they click around, it's like Facebook, I get it. <coughs> They've already been trained on how to use this stuff. <clears throat> so the next thing is, is there uh, a human being they can interact with because they want to send a question to a physician. Um, ideally one that avoids an appointment. If they can get a quick answer, they can avoid a, a wait for a, for a meeting. Um, and is there data coming? As soon as data arrives in the system, uh, they click and log in. Um, I mean, I'll give you one um, extreme example of how we then put our money where our mouth is. Uh, so we have uh, a model called gain share with our hospitals, uh, where we say uh, we'll discount our SaaS subscription right down. Um, so there's a minimum fee just for switching on the feed. And then if the patient logs in quickly enough to see the data that you don't have to post it to them, give us a share of the postage that you avoided. Uh, and so the system releases cash. As you, the more patients you register, the more cash it releases. Uh, and what we know is that within 48 hours, over 75% of patients look at their data. Uh, in fact, uh, within two hours, 50% of them look at the data. So the patients are highly engaged, they get it. Uh, this is all before COVID, by the way. Um, after COVID, engagement rates and registration rates went even more, even more up when, when everybody got a, a training course in Zoom and, and working remotely. But even before that, patients as consumers were digital, they were savvy, and they just needed to be allowed because they were all fully ready for engagement. Wow. So it's really the, the providers are working directly with their patients to notify them that this service exists and uh, they can, and it could be, is it also providers in labs or anyone within the healthcare ecosystem that notifies their patients anyone of your platform? anyone with data about the patient, the minute gotcha. they send it into patients in best, we automatically notify the patient that you've got a lab from the lab provider, you've got a oh. care plan from your physician, um, you have a, a message from your hospital, um, we notify you and you know, the patients are pretty quick in Interesting. looking at that data. So you reach out on behalf of your partners uh, as mm -hmm. you, they collect or push data into your platform. Correct. Gotcha. Wow. Very interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, I, I have a follow-up on this with, with, um, on the business model, but uh, before I even get into that, uh, it seems as though, especially when we talk about patient data and patient data management, uh, privacy is a big concern for a lot of people. And it's, you know, uh, the, even the term collection is a, it, we gotta be careful when we say collecting data, it's more of, you know, methods of gathering data and putting patients in control. Can you talk about the security and the privacy and or that, at least your approach to this concept in general and what you've done with your platform to approach it? Yes, uh, so we do a number of things. Um, the, the fundamental principle that we have is that uh, we may store the patient's data, but it is the patient's data and we can't do anything with it. Uh, so when I started in 2007, 2008, uh, Google and Microsoft were launching their platforms uh, and there really wasn't any trust in them because they were basically saying to the providers and to the patients, uh, you know, trust us, we will not misuse your data. Um, no one believed them. We, we said something different. We said, don't trust us, we cannot use your data. So every patient's record has its own public and private key. So anyone can put data into the patient's record with a public key, um, but only the patient and the parties the patient chooses have the private key. And we don't have the private key. So from us, from our perspective, we're storing a bunch of ones and zeros. Uh, if anyone hacks into the system, it's a bunch of ones and zeros. The only parties that can decrypt the ones and zeros are the patient 
and the providers the patient has consented to. Um, now, uh, we, we put that in our contracts. So when we sign a contract with a, a customer like a hospital, uh, we agree with them that all the data they copy into our platform, uh, that copy belongs to the patient. Uh, so because it belongs to the patient, we can't sell it, we can't advertise around it, it, it's theirs. And even if we wanted to, which we don't, we can't get to it because it's encrypted. Uh, and the final thing is we operate as a, a B corporation, a benefit corporation. Uh, so I'm not sure if you're aware of that certification from the USA, it's international uh, certification for social enterprises. Uh, we basically had a business model that's around getting paid for doing the right thing, uh, rather than uh, leaving any space for doing something that people don't want in the future. So um, we get paid for the storage. Uh, the encryption ensures we can't do anything else beyond store. Uh, and all the business models around advertising, selling data and so on, uh, we don't do them. Um, our customers won't let, them, won't let us and our encryption won't let us. Uh, so th all these things are what reassure the patient that it, it's their record and they decide what happens to it and, and we have no ability to do anything with it. Interesting. Can you highlight that uh, uh, that social certification that you talked about, and then also blend in, blend that into the the business model itself? Because I think, uh, from my understanding, to patients, it's free to use. It's free to interface with. It's free to manage your own data. Uh, I'm I'm curious what is on the uh, how you guys actually uh, built that relationship with the providers and partners you've worked with. Cool. Um, let me just. Uh... So we are a benefits corporation, uh, which means um, I am uh, duty bound to be extremely enthusiastic to tell everyone in the world about benefits corporations. So I'd like to show this to you. Um, Perfect. So, uh, so a, a benefits corporation uh, is a certification model that was started in the USA. Uh, it was started by a couple of founders who created um, a, a great company um, it treated its employees and its customers well and were good stewards of the environment. But after they sold their company, um, the acquirer just wound all of that back and then uh, it was nothing like what they recognized it to be. So uh, benefits corporations are ones that put in their articles of association uh, a commitment to things beyond profit and the ability of directors and officers of the company to think about more than profit when they make decisions. Um, with, with the company. Um, so the certification was important to us uh, because uh, it allows us to build a great company to stand the test of time uh, and it's international certification. So although it started in the USA, um, countries like the Netherlands and Italy uh, also created legislation that recognizes the corporations. Um, and in 2015, we were in the first cohort of UK companies uh, they're certified in that way. Um, so other companies are Etsy, for example, um, who um, were venture capital funded, but they're still on the stock market, but we're always about the makers and the ethos and the ethics. Um, and so we got that certification uh, and we tell uh, all, our uh, all our customers about that as well as all our patients. Um, in terms of um, B corporations, when you get certified, there is a public profile about everything that you do. Uh, you have to be above a certain high threshold to count as a B corporation, and you're reassessed every three years uh, to go through that. Um, th they assess you on governance, what you do with your employees, with community environment, and so on. Uh, so we, we tick a whole bunch of boxes, right? We uh, operate in the business model where the patient owns the data. Everything we do uh, around healthcare delivery improves the health of the patient. Uh, and because we digitize things, uh, we really facilitate the environment uh, improvements to patients. So if they don't get letters, if they don't have to go to the hospital, if, they, if you avoid progression to uh, operations, all these things are carbon intensive activities uh, that you can prevent at the same time as improving the health of the person. Wow. I didn't even know about this. This is really impressive. The, the, these guys are awesome. Um, I, I particularly want to highlight them uh, to your investors. Uh, so we received venture capital investment in 2015 from Bolton, we're one of Europe's uh, three top VCs. 
uh, one of the big signals for us was that that was the year that we were also going for certification. One of the big signals for us was whether they understood that we were going for that certification, that we would change our articles of association at the same time as receiving the investments from them in our Series A. Uh, and they did, they, they completely got it. Um, last month, uh, they held a session for all their portfolio companies uh, to explain to them B Corp, because many of them were also going through the certification. So we're finding, um, I mean, we, we think it's great, but we're finding also the venture capital industry and the startup industry, uh, all of them are seeing the benefits of explaining this to consumers, um, as well as it, it's a tremendous way to recruit people. We get a lot of hires who like the fact that we offer as a, operate as a social enterprise. Um, they, they get that, they want to be part of it. Um, I, I, I highly recommend um, being certified as a B Corporation. Wow, this is really cool. I didn't even know. I should have. I should have even looked uh, more more intently on the about page. I uh, that's that's absolutely incredible. I um, well now take that. Uh, let's go another step further on on the data or the being able to have a centralized location and giving patients and control of their own data. I mean, having a in this case a centralized location or really a you could say decentralized. Each individual has control of their data. I feel like so for healthcare, that's very powerful. And there's a lot of things you can do with that. And I'm curious, can you uh, highlight some of the use cases or applications you're building on top of that to me within, within your ecosystem? Um, I feel like there's a lot. Uh, and there's a lot of use cases you could go. But I'm, I'm just curious if you could highlight a handful of them, especially the ones that are um, you see the most engagement in. If I get back to PowerPoint slides for a second. Um, I'm, I'm just going to start with the, 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 the basic obvious thing, right, which just this makes healthcare better, right. Um, this is a case study that was done um, in Southeast England. Uh, they had 4,000 patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, IBD affects about one in every 150 people. Um, most of the time you're fine and then you're really not fine. You flare up and you need urgent attention. Uh, and the longer periods of being fine, the longer you can keep your gut without having to have surgery. And the faster you can get treatment during a flare up, again, the longer you can keep your gut and stay away from surgery. So uh, these guys, they're registered all their patients. Uh, if you came to clinic, they say, this is your data. I need you to have your data. I'm going to give you a patient's their best account that will give you your test results. As soon as I have them, you will have them. And I will give you instructions on what to do. So take these medications in the care plan at this time. Normally, if you get a flare up, this is what you need to do without waiting to call me. This is what you need to do. And if these things happen, I want to hear from you immediately. And you can tell me immediately because you can consult with me online through PKB. And in the meantime, you can keep track of your symptoms also on PKB. So I can see how you're going uh, week to week. Uh, so just using that, they say four million pounds, that's about four and a half million dollars, five million US dollars um, on those 4,000 patients. And that was really from, uh, they could change medications that were um, more cost effective, but they tend to be avoided because of the side effects profile. So if you can monitor the patients more frequently, you can identify which patients are okay and which patients need different medications. Um, they avoided appointments, so that freed up capacity for the patients who needed attention and freed up time for the patients who didn't need to go for the appointments. Uh, and because the patients who needed help got help more quickly, uh, they prevented progression to surgery. So this is one cohort, one disease in one region. You can see the, the cost savings you can do. Um, and, and the patients love it. I mean, the, I mean, for me, one of the most moving stories was I saw one of the patients, a young man, uh, he was a student, and uh, this affects people at working age. Um, he almost dropped out of university. He said, the only thing that kept me in was having this system uh, because I, I didn't have any control over my health, over my life. I was going to go back home and just stay with my parents because things were so bad. But because I had the system, because I could see the data, because I could add to the data, and because whenever I got stuck, my physician was one message away, I stayed at university. He's now graduated. Uh, he's in the workplace. Um, it, it's stories like that from just having the data and adding to the data. Um, now, when you're asking me, what can you do um, 
for the platform. Um, I, I'll just uh, quick run through. So the kinds of things that we do, this is what happens when you combine data from different record systems like Sterner in a hospital, uh, or in the UK, you have EMIS in physician's offices. Um, silos of data all arrive in the one record wherever the patient's gone. Um, this is what happens when you can collect data from the patient. So we have the most depth in patient engagement of any platform. You can track their symptoms, connect over 100 devices, uh, give them their test results, and then do a shared care plan between you and the patient of what they want to do. Uh, and that was the reason that uh, renal patient use switched to us. So this was a disease portal for all dialysis patients in the UK, uh, across 74 hospitals in all the UK. Uh, a couple of months ago, they uh, gave us the contract to switch all their hospitals over to us because a generic system that can do anything was more powerful for kidney disease than a custom kidney uh, system. Uh, and so we're now doing the same thing for cancer portal. We just got the contract uh, in the UK for the Somerset Cancer Register and so on. Basically, every disease area is better uh, if you put the patients on the one system. Um, then you start combining data from regions. So we started in 2015 in Northwest London, that was 2.4 million people. Uh, London is almost 9 million people. Uh, and basically, uh, people in London do not, care, do not read the government's plans for how hospitals should be organized. They, they, they go wherever they want to. They, uh, every 12 months, 20% of them move house and change provider. Uh, so uh, for them to have one system, no matter where the patient has gone, was very powerful for safety. Now, what they discovered when they switched this on is they found data from all over the UK, from um, Manchester, Birmingham, Bristol, parts of Wales, all that was available to patients in London because these patients go everywhere in the UK. And then the Welsh national government, uh, so that's three and a half million people, did the integration with us. This is what we pursue in the long term, a contract with the national government to say, if a patient registers, give us all their data because we will empower them wherever they go. Uh, and then people, um, this at national level, this is the NHS app, uh, England, which is 55 million people, has a national app. Um, we're the first and the only ones to integrate inside it. Uh, this is what I'm so excited about in my video. So we now unveiled, sorry, this, we now unveiled uh, the app where it's branded by the NHS, it's branded by the national government, uh, but the full functionality is all delivered by PKB. Uh, the test results, the care plans, the speed tracking and so on. And we're bringing this to other governments all over the world saying, look, you may have built your COVID app for test and trace, um, but now you want to build on that by giving a full personal health record with your brand, with your sovereign app. So we can white label uh, our product inside their national infrastructure. Um, and then uh, all the different uh, third parties in the ecosystem, you know, the thousands of companies you talk about, can integrate with that in the two-way API, whether it's um, tracking um, information from the patients at home, allowing them to book an appointment. Uh, we have um, current health here. Uh, they're being used for COVID patients because you can, that they stream into the PKB record, uh, your oxygen saturations and your breathing rate. So if you have a COVID patient, you wanna isolate them at home for their, for their safety and the rest of the healthcare economy safety, but you wanna track them real time. And that comes into PKB with the API. Um, and then people build solutions on top. So in the Netherlands, uh, Radboud built a platform for blood cancer patients. Uh, there are 2000 patients in the Netherlands with chronic myeloid leukemia. One of the 2000s are already on the system and they're rolling this out across the Netherlands at the national standard. And then they'll expand it to all blood cancers, that's 60,000 patients across the Netherlands and so on. So all of that is possible when you have a data platform with patient engagement and um, a single record that's complete accurate in real time following the patient wherever they go. It's absolutely incredible. You know, this is the thing that I think uh, many might overlook when, when you look at a patient data management tool and think that it's just a way to view your health record. It's, it is the interface for almost every other category across healthcare. I mean, there's telemedicine features with the new platform. There's health management tools, both from the care, you know, for the provider side to the individual. Uh, there's, you can even get into the, the medication side and being able to track users and out the symptom tracking. Well, and so much more. And I think that's, that's what I think is really powerful. And this is also the reason why we reached out and we thought we're really impressed with the platform that you've built out. 
Um, really incredible. I, I'm curious, it feels like it's really difficult to sell or try to partner with providers or any healthcare stakeholders um, and to, to work and integrate with EHR solutions, et cetera. I mean, you wrote a book on it, so I'm pretty sure <laughs> you're well, well aware of this. But I, most companies seem to have much longer sales cycles within the healthcare ecosystem, have really hard time with working with providers. How have you managed this process? Uh, I'm not gonna lie, it, it, uh, a lot of it's just taking time. It's being, um, it's remaining alive long enough during healthcare providers' decision cycles. Uh, it's not just that they are uh, slow and bureaucratic, and uh, it's because they're highly regulated. Um, literally, if you make a mistake, lives are, lives are at stake. Uh, and meanwhile, while you're trying to make all these changes, which um, you believe are improvements and you want them to believe the same thing, they're still trying to run a hospital. They still have to do everything else without stopping. They can't just say, okay, we're gonna stop for six months and then we'll start again with a property. No, they still have to run all the old processes until the new process picks up and it's better and, and releases capacity. Uh, so a lot of um, companies enter the space uh, and they either leave, uh, so the Googles, the Microsofts, uh, the big telcos and so on, because they um, don't have the the patience or the ability to inter interpret the signals in the healthcare marketplace long enough to prove the point. Uh, or the small companies, um, they try and take the, the traditional um, non-healthcare VC funding route and they, they scale up too soon. And then they run out of time to prove their point and they crash and die. So um, now once it works, um, I mean, it's 10% of every economy, right? Uh, the healthcare is so enormous and so inefficient that even a small change means billions of dollars in every nation. Um, but you have to be around long enough to prove that. Once you prove that, um, you know, th there's a, an enormous opportunity uh, for doing well and doing good. Um, but it's the sequencing that we have to get right. Um, and the thing about being a, a data platform, if you're going to receive all the data, it is enormous trust that people have to have in you. Uh, and there are literally thousands of things that you have to get right. So uh, a lot of this was about getting um, the right people joining the company. Uh, there, there's a particular profile we look for, which I call um, patient and patient. So you are impatient enough with the healthcare system because you understand it, it sucks and it's unacceptable that patients get treated in this way. Uh, but you are patient enough to stay around and fix it. It's going to take a really long time. So we have a whole team of these people who um, they're missionary about it. They want these things fixed and they're going to stay around long enough to, for it to be fixed. And when our customers see that, they realize, um, yep, I can put my data on this platform. It will be handled correctly. These guys have thought of a thousand things I haven't even thought thought of and they've spent a long time many years getting the solutions right um, that's what now allows us to go to governments right we, we can get government scale contracts um, nation scale contracts that, that's what we're looking for interesting and I think that already kind of answers my second question to follow up from that but I'm still going to ask it anyways just to reiterate this I'm curious what are these what are the, the typically the deliverables that are you pitching to these partners or governments and what really resonates with them so uh, in every territory, our first customers are providers. And for them, it's a way of either saving money or making money. So typically, if it's a government-funded healthcare system, um, then it's about saving money. They've got a fixed budget. They have to treat as many people as possible according to government guidelines. If it's more of a private system, it's about making money because if they can deliver higher quality service, they can attract more patients uh, against their competitors. But that, for a provider, uh, it's really shifting the price performance ratio for healthcare delivery. Um, then when we establish ourselves, we prove that it works in a territory, we go for a payer. Um, whether it's a, a dominant insurer or group of insurers or an ACO equivalent in a geographic entity. Um, or if it's a small nation, we go directly to the, to the government of that nation and say, let's get a nationwide contract. 
and what they're looking for initially they think this is about um you know every government has um, a, a political uh, ambition to have transparency in the healthcare system uh, and, and that's great we've got that you can show your citizens all their data and instead of uh, being scared that this is going to google or to microsoft you can be proud that it's going to a big corporation that's encrypting all your data and the patient owns the record. Um, fundamentally though, what we're really trying to do is every government wants to deliver or maintain the promise of universal coverage. They don't, they don't want people uninsured. They don't want, uh, it, it's not just a, uh, a human right. Uninsured people cost more in their lack of insurance um, if they uh, don't get covered because you, you pay more for the emergency department. Um, however, the current healthcare systems cannot scale anymore as they are. Um, we don't have enough money for above inflation rises in healthcare spending. And even if we did, we don't have enough physicians or nurses. They're all retiring more than there are joiners in the profession. So you need a mechanism for at least some of the patients to self-assess and self-manage. You need to, that's what structurally changes the cost of the health delivery in the health economy. If some of the people can look after themselves because 80% of healthcare spending is on long-term conditions. If you don't take the pills, it doesn't matter what the physician did with their prescription. If you don't change your diet, if you don't exercise, uh, the structural cost of healthcare delivery are much higher and continue to rise. Uh, so this is what we what we say to governments at a long term scale. The only way you will continue to deliver on that promise of universal coverage for your population uh, is if you give them the data to look after themselves and have the data follow the patients who can't look after themselves. So it's cheaper for the providers to help them proactively. Um, that that's the pitch that we make. Wow. It's, it's incredible the, your ambition and your approach of not only going after specific providers, specific region, but entire, entire uh, governments and national healthcare plans. Um, uh, I, you know, to kind of put in perspective, so the audience has a, a good idea of why and how important this is and uh, how big of an impact uh, your platform can have on an ecosystem. Can you give us in a general sense of what is the general market size for patient data management, or at least the influence it can have on the healthcare ecosystem? So for me, the, the comparator that I look at is um, mobile telcos. Mm -hmm. uh, so I remember the 90s and the 2000s, um, when a telco comes into a country, an African country, um, literally one to two percent increases in GDP happen every year. Uh, if you have a mobile telco versus if you don't, um, it just changes the whole structure of an economy. Uh, the fact that you can move information without moving people, uh, and you can leapfrog uh, over Western patterns um, if you have that technology. Uh, so we see us. This is why we like to work with governments. We we make the pitch to a government that. Um, given that you spend 10% of health of your GDP on healthcare, um, and it's so inefficient, if you have a platform that moves the data around without moving the patient around, that's gonna structurally change the, the cost base of your health economy and transform the quality of your, your healthcare. Um, th those are the kind of comparators that we do. And really it becomes the foundation layer for everything else because all the new innovations coming through, you know, the new sensors, uh, the new analytics, uh, the new uh, science with what do you do with the genetic sequence? What does that imply for your behavior and what you should do? Um, all the machine learning, all of those things depend on a data layer. If you don't have a single data layer for the sensors to put data in, for the machine learning to compute on, for the analytics to uh, bring up alerts, um, you're just repeating the silos. You're missing the, the benefits of all these new technologies. But if you do have them, the, the synergy is extraordinary. Uh, it, it's, it's a golden age that we're encountering in healthcare now because of digital in healthcare. Really interesting. And I think it's, it's unique that uh, the point that you just made, which is 
by having a, a data layer at baseline helps integrate all these cool, unique features that we're seeing across all other health segments. Um, and without it, it's challenging. Um, I mean, I um, I, I'll give you a, a trivial example. So I, you look much long, younger than I am, so you may not remember this, but I came to the States in 2003. Um, and that year, um, American Idol had started. Um, and there was this British guy who'd come over, um, Simon from the UK. And the thing that struck me wasn't that um, you know, the poor Americans now had American Idol inflicted on them. The, what really struck me was that year, the big, big pitch in American Idol was uh, num you could text them your vote no matter which cell phone provider you're using. It was the first year that uh, Singular, that was the first name for at and and Verizon Wireless and all the and T-Mobile and so on could text each other. Before then, um, uh, at and could only text at and Verizon could only text Verizon and so on. Um, can you imagine the iPhone coming in that environment? Can you imagine uh, TikTok and all the new innovations that we have coming in? No, because there are all these silos. Um, the minute you connect into one network and they're able to interoperate, um, all the cool stuff starts happening. Uh, healthcare is not even 2003. We're talking 1995, 1990 levels of interoperability. And that's just making everything it, it's not just expensive it's dangerous uh, and and that's what we're trying to do with that single data layer all the good stuff happens after that wow i think you uh i like your american idol reference <laughs> that's a good comparison <laughs> <laughs> i'm curious and, and we're, i i hope you have a little bit more time if mm -hmm. you don't have a hard stop okay uh i just have a few more questions and one of the I'm curious, one of the things that I'm curious about, especially the position that you're in, is how has the pandemic really changed uh, how you guys operate today? So uh, I, I say a couple of things. Um, first of all, it didn't affect us in the workplace because uh, when we started in 2008, um, since, since that day, we've always been working from home. So we have uh, 75 employees across 12 different countries. We all work from home. Uh, and so the, the lockdown didn't affect us. It's, um, we didn't have an office to retreat from. Um, I hope you like my background, but actually in my shed, in, in my uh, house in Cambridge. Um, but what did change was um, we no longer had to explain ourselves. Uh, so before COVID, um, most people would get what we're trying to say after we explain it, when we say, look, it's safe, the patient can get it. Uh, they will save you time, it won't increase anxiety and so on, but we'd have to explain it to them. When COVID hit, um, we didn't have to explain things anymore because every provider realized that their, more of their patients would be more safe if they had more data more quickly. So the COVID patients who had to isolate and couldn't come to the hospital to keep the hospital safe and to keep themselves safe, but still needed treatment, they needed monitoring. Um, if they had a data platform um, sending the symptoms and this oxygen saturation to the hospital and sending back the test results and the care plans to the patient, those COVID patients were safer. And then the non-COVID patients who had all their appointments canceled, their operations canceled, you know, they still had diabetes, they still had cancer. They still needed to get their data and they couldn't even go to a hospital with all their specialists anymore. They had to go to individual clinics, get a quick test, and then go somewhere else for another silo. And if they had their data, they could monitor themselves and they could consult, uh, you know, what should I do with my fever, with my insulin medication? Should I up my dose or should I carry on if I have a fever with diabetes? Um, the biology continued, they, they helped maintain. So uh, since March, when the lockdown started in the UK, um, we have been working nonstop, um, doing the work that we've, always enjoy doing, which is just, we just get to deliver this stuff without arguing or um, evangelizing anymore. Everybody gets it. Everybody wants everybody to have this as quickly as possible. Uh, and it's just all hands on deck. Um, we're now using this to go into government scale conversations. Uh, and we're also expanding into other territories uh, where there isn't universal healthcare, uh, places like India and so on. 
uh, where it's more about being uh, with a consumer pays model uh, or a telco bun uh, bundled model. Um, that really this is now universally, globally understood. Um, and we just get to do that a lot more. Interesting. Interesting. And, uh, and I'm curious, um, and you, you may have already highlighted it before, but um, uh, what, I, what do you think is the future of patient data management? And what do you see that most people don't? Uh, so when uh, when we started, um, the the people who gave us the time said, "Yeah, I get it. This is for rare disease patients." Um, so the one percent who have a rare condition, um, and by the way, rare diseases are individually rare, but they're extremely common in aggregate. There are thirty million people with a rare condition in Western Europe and the USA. Um, I get it for those people. That's why you're getting the London contract with Great Ormond Street Hospital with the children all over the UK. Uh, it's very complex, it's very important. Um, then they said, okay, we get it. This is for people with long-term conditions, with 20% of the population with diabetes, heart conditions, and so on, that account for 80% of healthcare spending. Um, but what we think is that this is for 100% of the population, including the 80% who are healthy, who want to stay healthy. I'm talking to you about data streaming from the hospital and the uh, home blood pressure cuff. Um, but I also want the data to stream from your grocery store because all the food that you ate um, or, or the, the barcodes of the food that you ate um, determine your diet and the gym that you exercised or, or didn't exercise in uh, that affects your body's fitness. All of that is data to, to keep you well. Um, and it applies for everyone regardless of language. Uh, the system works in 20 different languages and we keep on adding more every year. Um, it works on any device and basically the patient's phone is more powerful than the physician's computer. Uh, this thing is universal in, in every geography. Um, it works for people who um, lack capacity. They may have dementia, but somebody else who looks after them can have the permission to look at their data and help look after them. Um, it helps children with rare disease, with, uh, with um, childhood diseases, take control over their health sooner in their lives and the sooner they understand and look after their health, the less damage there is to their bodies by the time they reach adulthood. Um, it works for people with learning difficulties. It really is for everybody at every stage. That, that's the thing that we see, um, that it's not for a particular niche or a particular healthy and wealthy. It really is for everyone, cradle to grave. Wow. I think that's a fantastic question to end on. Uh, Mohammed, I really appreciate your time. Uh, before we close out, I'm curious, is there anything that you wanted to announce or ask of or share with the audience? Um, the, the big thing um, for me is the expansion into emerging markets like India, um, where there isn't any existing uh, universal coverage, but there is an expanding middle class. Um, and the, the business models we look at um, are just either uh, sort of consumer pays or employer pays um, where there's a culture of the patient taking their paper notes between appointment to appointment. Um, and then the other one is approaching telcos, um, especially in emerging markets in Africa uh, or East Asia. Um, you know about Safaricom where um, in those territories in uh, East Africa, in Kenya, uh, you know, they had currency union through a cell phone 10 years before the Euro happened in, in Europe. Uh, they had mobile payments 15 years before anything in, in the West. Uh, so the next thing for them is if you're carrying your cell phone between appointments, you should carry your medical record on your cell phone. Uh, and so telcos is the other business model that we look at. Awesome. Mohammed, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And again, for the audience who understood uh, the purpose of the interview is we took, we looked at well over 120 companies that we call in the data management category. Uh, we knew Patients Know Best was one of the best companies within this category. Uh, we had the opportunity to chat with Mohammed to give us a little bit more detail about why you're one of the best companies in this category, what makes you important, and especially the power that having a baseline data at, at government scale is so important for just being able to move forward in any direction in healthcare. 
And I, I really like, and I really appreciate taking the time to share with that, with us, why that's important in, in the platform that you've built and how you've been able to really create that connector for everybody else. Um, so this was fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time, Mohammed. I really appreciate it. An honor to talk to you, Carl. Thank you for, for inviting us.